John Locke on Freedom, by Samuel Rickless. First published on Stanford Encyclopedia Philosophy. Part 2, Will and Willing. Within the category of actions, Locke distinguishes between those that are voluntary and those that are involuntary. To understand this distinction, we need to understand Locke's account of the will and his account of willing, or volition. For Locke, the will is a power, ability, faculty, possessed by a person, or by that person's mind. Locke explains how we come by the idea of power, but does not offer a theory of the nature of power. What we are told is that powers are relations, relations to action or change, and that powers are either active, that is, powers to make changes, or passive, that is, powers to receive changes. In this sense, the will is an active relation to actions. Locke's predecessors had thought of the will as intimately related to the faculty of desire or appetite. For the scholastics, whose works Locke read as a student at Oxford, the will is the power of rational appetite. For Thomas Hobbes, by whom Locke was deeply influenced even though this was not something he could advertise because Hobbes was a pariah in Locke's intellectual and political circles, the will is simply the power of desire itself. Remnants of this desiderative conception of the will remain in Locke's theory, particularly in the first edition of the essay. Here, for example, is Locke's official account of the will in the first edition of an essay concerning human understanding. This power the mind has to prefer the consideration of any idea to the not considering it, or to prefer the motion of any part of the body to its rest. And here is Locke's official account of preferring in the same edition. Well, but what is this preferring? It is nothing but the being pleased more with the one, than the other. So, in the first edition, the will is the mind's power to be more pleased with the consideration of an idea than with the not considering it, or to be more pleased with the motion of a part of one's body than with its remaining at rest. When we lack something that would deliver more pleasure than we currently experience, we become uneasy at its absence. And this kind of uneasiness, or pain, is what Locke describes as desire, though also as joined with, scarce distinguishable from, and a cause of desire. So, in the first edition of an essay concerning human understanding, the will is the mind's power to desire or want the consideration of an idea more than the not considering it, or to desire or want the motion of a part of one's body more than its remaining at rest. At the second to the fifth edition, Locke adds and vice versa, to clarify that it can also happen, even according to the first edition account, that one prefers not considering an idea to considering it, or not moving to moving. In keeping with this conception of the willer's desire, Locke in the first edition then defines an exercise of the will, which he calls willing or volition, as an actual preferring of one thing to another. For example, I have the power to prefer the upward motion of my arm to its remaining at rest by my side. This power, in addition one, is one aspect of my will. When I exercise this power, I actually prefer the upward motion of my arm to its remaining at rest, that is, I am more pleased with my arm's upward motion than I am with its continuing to rest. This is what Locke, in the first edition, thinks of as my willing the upward motion of my arm, or, as he sometimes puts it, my willing or volition to move my arm upward. In the second to the fifth edition, Locke explicitly gives up this conception of the will and willing, explaining why he does so, making corresponding changes in the text of the essay, even while leaving passages that continue to suggest the desiderative conception. He writes, though a man would prefer flying to walking, yet who can say he ever wills it? The thought here is that, as Locke recognizes, my being more pleased with flying than walking does not consist in, or even entail, my willing to fly. This is in large part because it is necessarily implied in willing motion of a certain sort that one exert dominion that one takes oneself to have, that the mind endeavor to give rise to the motion, which it takes to be in its power. So, if I do not believe that it is in my power to fly, then it is impossible for me to will the motion of flying, even though I might be more pleased with flying than I am with any alternative. Locke concludes that preferring which seems perhaps best to express the act of volition, does it not precisely. In addition, 
Locke points out that it is possible for the will and desire to run counter. For example, as a result of being coerced or threatened, I might will to persuade someone of something, even though I desire that I not succeed in persuading her. Or, suffering from gout, I might desire to be eased of the pain in my feet, and yet at the same time, recognizing that the translation of such pain would affect my health for the worse, will that I not be eased of my foot pain. In concluding that desiring and willing are two distinct acts of the mind, Locke must be assuming that it is not possible to will an action and its contrary at the same time. With what conception of the will and willing does Locke replace the abandoned desiderative conception? The answer is that in additions 2 to 5 Locke describes the will as a kind of directive or commanding faculty, the power to direct or issue commands to one's body or mind, it is, he writes, a power to begin or forbear, continue or end several actions of our minds and motions of our bodies, barely by a thought or preference of the mind ordering, or as it were commanding the doing or not doing such or such particular action. Consonant with this non-desiderative, directive conception of the will, Locke claims that, volition, or willing, is an act of the mind directing its thought to the production of any action, and thereby exerting its power to produce it. That volition is nothing, but that particular determination of the mind, whereby, barely by a thought, the mind endeavors to give rise, continuation, or stop to any action, which it takes to be in its power. Every volition, then, is a volition to act or to forbear, where willing to act is a matter of commanding one's body to move or one's mind to think, and willing to forbear is a matter of commanding one's body to rest or one's mind not to think. Unlike a desiderative power, which is essentially passive, as involving the ability to be more pleased with one thing than another, the will in the first to the fifth edition is an intrinsically active power, the exercise of which involves the issuing of mental commands directed at one's own body and mind. The End <laughs>